Welcome! In this video, Bob, WB4APR, talks about his invention, APRS. This is APRS. I'd like to show people what APRS is. This is, this is Washington, D.C., Annapolis, Maryland, and Baltimore. And it's just a snapshot of the map showing that, you know, there are probably 300 people within 35 miles of here that are transmitting their APRS uh, packet radio stuff. And uh, anybody with a radio can hear what APRS is like. Now, you know, never give a live demo, it never works. Okay, so uh, I'm going to switch bands up here and change to the... Uh... Now, how many of you are... are well, everybody sounded like it was a ham. Yeah. Not everybody. Okay, but almost everybody. So, um, so I'm preaching to the choir here. But to give you an idea of what APRS is like, uh, I have now tuned into 144.39 and make a fool of me. Uh, we'll see if any of those tracking. And what revolution, what APRS did was it took packet radio, which was, you know, people just going point to point connections and, you know, you could do that with a phone. And uh, I said, but you never can find other people. So let's just put everything that's happening on one frequency and you know, you beacon what, you, what you're doing uh, once every 10 minutes. You know, say, hey, we're having an AM radio club. And so that beacon goes out once every 10 minutes and then anybody driving around the area picks up that beacon and in the beacon it shows, you know, the, the uh, what are we? <laughs> uh, hack uh, DC, uh, you know, the time and place of the meeting, it shows up on the map and everything else. So uh, the, the goal of APRS was to have that single channel on the entire North American continent. No matter where you were, you tuned into that channel, and after 10 minutes, you have gathered a map of where everybody is, what they're doing, any special events going on, and any bulletins and everything else. So it's kind of like a uh, flood of information. Um, and that's why the name, for a while I called it Automatic Position Reporting System, because at about the time that GPS came real cheap, wasn't it neat to be able to hook your GPS to automatically put your position in? Uh, but then uh, everybody got so totally focused on vehicle tracking and that it was nothing to do with what it was. It was about human-to-human -human communications on a single digital calling channel to establish communications as to what's going on. And um, so then I've reverted back to what it was originally, and that is automatic packet reporting system to emphasize that position reporting is just one of the many functions. Um, and of course, if you zoom out uh, nationwide, there's probably about 20,000 users. Now again, I've never looked up that number in the last 10 years. That's what it was 10 years ago. Uh, it, pretty, it has kind of plateaued. Everybody that's going to play with this is playing with it. Everybody who says, I don't need to be tracked um, uh, has, has dropped off. But the people that, those are the people that thought it was position reporting because, you know, to be honest, nobody cares where you are. Okay, and so if you're coming into APRS to transmit your position, nobody really gives a care uh, who. It's now, it's how can you use this, uh, this uh, international channel, no matter where you are and you have connectivity, how can we use that to do whatever we're doing in ham radio, not just position track. Yeah. Uh, feel free to interrupt me, and uh, probably I'll tell you that in the 90 slides yet to go, it'll already be covered. And, but if, if you want to interrupt me. Now this is the number of people on any given day that are, are setting their position through some of the APRS satellites. And uh, you know we have uh, the original PC sat, which has been up there since 2001, and of course the International Space Station. We have a ham radio on the International Space Station that relays APRS. And uh, it is absolutely amazing that we have not heard anything. If we were on an outside antenna, is there a radio over here that's a VHF on an outside antenna? Uh, we don't have the antenna hooked up because we just moved the ham shack. Okay, <coughs> anyway, uh, it would be almost wall-to-wall -wall packets if, you know, if we had an antenna up uh, high enough. Um, so, well, and the point there is that, remember the map before this, where, yeah, it stops at the coastline, right? Just like cell phone does. But with APRS, since we have uh, at least three operating satellites now, uh, you can be anywhere on the planet. And all you need is a VHF radio, and you can send your data, and it will appear on your desk. You just go to APRS.fi, which is the, uh, it, you know, every one of those people on this map, that is, that's their home station, everything they hear, they just feed into the internet. And so this is being collected from all over the world, and you have about 50 to 100 packets per second coming in from all over the world, and you can just mine that for anything you want. And, and, and the APRS.fi page is a page 
that it happens to be in Finland, but he wrote the best user interface, and it just captures everything global, and, uh, and then uh, you can mine it. Uh, so now what I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the amateur satellites that have uh, APRS on them. And uh, PCSAT was launched in 2001. It's still up there, barely working. The ISS since 2006. PSAT, which is this one over here, a CubeSat, about that big, uh, was launched just in May. And QuickCom 2, which I'm going to demonstrate here, uh, is next. And I should be working on it instead of getting this talk. Uh, the whole idea of uh, the satellites we build at the Naval Academy is only five or six students get to work on that per semester. But when we put one of our APR satellites in space, you get thousands of students around the world that can now play with space with the ground terminal application. In other words, what can you do on the ground knowing that you've got a satellite that can get your data from anywhere on the planet back to your, your desktop computer uh, instantly, live. It's not storing forward, it's live. So I use this slide to show all the possible ground search uh, applications. Is everybody familiar with APRS? Uh, sort of, okay. A little bit. But yeah, the concept is that APRS is local. It's just local VHF range, two or three or four or five miles. Then we put repeaters on top of uh, towers in the area, and that extends it out 10, 20 miles. Uh, and everybody in that 10, 20 mile radius, everybody sees everybody, you see the whole network, you know, you saw that 350 people uh, in the DC metro area. Um, but everybody who has a home station feeds everything into the, into the cloud, just like everybody else in the world is. And so everybody can see everything that's happening anywhere. Um, and of course, when the satellite comes over, that footprint is 3,000 miles across. And everybody in there for five minutes gets to, can do stuff. Um, for example, here's a buoy some students built to float up in the Arctic. And of course, ham radio operators have been flying balloons for um, uh, dozens of years. But now almost every single one of them has an APRS transmitter on it. And it's just the only, I'm trying to point from the projector. We launched uh, five space balloons here. And I don't know if we used APRS that was before. We did. We used it. Uh, that's right. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah, the beauty of it is because it makes it easier to just go walking out there and, and okay. pick up your satellite. Now, and here's what I justify to the DOD who pays for my satellites, is that, but look, when one of these balloons, once it gets out over the Atlantic, you know, cell phone range, or not cell phone range, but VHF range away, away from the last island, because there's a ham radio operator on every island, um, then you lose contact with that balloon. And look at this one. That, that was the first one, uh, and it landed over there in Morocco. And there's a whole story about going out there and finding it and getting it back. But just this last year, it is unbelievable. Now, uh, last year, it's probably a year ago now, a guy launched this, uh, the call sign is not on there, it went around the world four times. That was the Aussies, wasn't it? Uh, no, you know, I don't even know who launched it. The VKs? Yeah, your, your map shows it's taken off from Australia. Okay, that's this one. It didn't uh, make it around the world once. Uh, but anyway, but look at the size of these things. Well, okay. And now here's the other thing. These guys were smart. As soon as they went up in the you know, Nowheresville, there was no, no APRS up there. And the point is, I'm using here is they're using the terrestrial frequency because they got 40,000 people listening as opposed to the space frequency where you have a lot fewer people and you only get a couple hits a day. So there was no data from up in there. But what these guys did was when they transmitted their position, they transmitted a portion of the last um, 60 positions or something. So, you know, they're kind of always feeding forward. So that even though this thing went up and was not heard from, as soon as it was heard from again down in this area, it, it's, uh, its entire track was, was downloaded over time so that you were able to fill that in. Uh, we don't know what happened up there and you again got picked up over the Atlantic. So that was, that was my point. But look at the size of that thing. I mean, you guys in this room can build that. Because uh, all it is is, you know, a little one, one chip transmitter, a little bit of solar power. Now this one did not have a GPS in it. This one has a GPS in it. It's really just a little black bag. Why are you painting black? A lot of people will set up a styrofoam cooler. Yeah, we did that. Okay. But there's no reason to do that. Because remember, once you're above the clouds, you got the sun up there. It's hotter than the hottest July day. So you put it in a clear bottle and use solar to heat it up. And you don't need all that insulation. You got to do something to it because it's minus 60 up there, and most electronics is not going to work at minus 60. But put it in a clear plastic coat bottle, and it'll be uh, room temperature uh, and a much lighter weight. And if it falls in the water, it's sealed, it floats. You know. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there's a there, uh, the ARRL is supporting a, a project that you know a lot of schools uh, kids are building you know Mars rovers, little robots and things. 
the ham radio guys at DRL said, wait a minute, why not let them remote control them? So if a school in Pasadena builds one and a school in Maryland builds a robot, they wait until the International Space Station flies in between and these guys try to command those guys rover and these guys try to command those guys rover and you're doing almost exactly what you're doing in, in the real world in, in commanding a vehicle on Mars. I thought that was just a fantastic idea. Uh, so again, uh, as an outreach, you've got all kinds of student groups that are building stuff. You know, this is a maker group. Uh, and just don't forget that you can tie those projects into a global ham radio network. Of course, you can do it with the internet. But um, this is uh, everywhere because the satellite eventually come over. Um, this is typically what the radio shows. In fact, we're not hearing anything. I'm going to turn this off and let it charge a little bit because I don't, don't know what this was when I grabbed it today. But uh, in addition to everything that you, everybody that you receive will show up on the map of your attached GPS, um, this, um, it also shows you know, all the call signs. But then we realized, wait a minute, I can see all these people on the map, but I want to communicate with them. So the one thing we left out of APRs when we invented it back in 1993 was the frequency. We needed to have a field so that you could show not only where you are, but what frequency you're monitoring so that people could contact you. And so in 2004, we added that to the protocol so that if you send your frequency, um, uh, it'll show up over here on the right-hand side. Or if you're a voice repeater or any other ham radio object, which is whole reason for being as a frequency, you can actually use that as the call sign field. And now uh, it's very easy to just, to just say sort alphabetically, and all the nearby frequencies, repeaters will show up. You don't have to carry an ARL handbook or anything else, a repeater directory guide, because the radios are telling you. Uh, because one channel, the entire country, everything is telling you where they are and what frequency they're on. And then Kenwood and uh, Yezu uh, followed up with my recommendation. And so now, you see the little pointer? When you move the pointer up to there and, and click, uh, uh, you hit the tune button, it'll instantly cause that radio to tune to that repeater, including the offsets and PL and everything. So that, that was the original goal, was a single calling channel, uh, digital, but it lets people find each other and instantly make contact. <coughs> And of course, it's all tied into the uh, internet, Google Maps, the whole nine yards. Um, and because every packet transmitted anywhere on Earth is grabbed by this big network, that is the one year full life of telemetry from one of our satellites. We didn't even use our own ground station because all I had to do was go to APRS.FI, call up the last year's worth of packets from that satellite, which just got archived, and there's a plot. The green is the outside temperature on the outside of the spacecraft, and the red is the temperature on the, on the inside, on the core. But again, what I tell students is, if you've got any project whatsoever, you build it, transmit it on 144.39 anywhere in North America, and your data is going to show up on your desktop, or you'll have access to it. Uh, but of all the things we built, uh, PCSAT and, and the, on the International Space Station are the only two that are still alive. All of these got uh, short rides into space that have, have all come in and burned up since then. So uh, it wasn't until this last launch just in May that we now have another satellite out there that's going to last for a couple of years. Uh, and we've been able to condense it down from a 10 inch to 10 inch tray down to a 3 inch by 3 inch card. Uh, and, and this card is nothing but a, a bionics.com uh, APRs tracker. You know, it was designed just for putting in your, your car and tracking your car, but you know, it has eight digital input outputs that you can remotely command and has five analog inputs for your telemetry and things. Um, and of course, we have ground stations all around the world. Anybody's a ground station, that can be a ground station. Just you know, take the serial out, run it into your laptop, and uh, uh, not FTP, what's the live? Uh, I even forgot to turn. See, I'm, I'm really dated. I don't do anything with the internet. And that, that's what I punched out. Um, but you know, a live serial connection to the uh, to the U and that's not a URL to the TCP/IP address of the global network. Everything goes in, and anybody can uh, you know sign on the report and get the entire global feed. Um, ground stations for the satellites. Oh, and this is, is, is that a Raspberry Pi? Yes. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, so this is the ground station for uh, the International Space Station and APRS, and all it is is a Raspberry Pi and the DVG dongle. 
This is, you know, the, the little dong you can buy for, what is it, 60 bucks or something? 10. 10 bucks. 10 bucks. Okay. And you run DSP software. So that's the antenna going up there, cable, and that's the internet connection. And now you've got a ground station. So, you know, very easy to put a ground station anywhere on Earth. Uh, and, of course, uh, our buoys have shrunk from, you know, something big with an HT all the way down to, you know, a fat cigar. And this shows you that if you're beaconing on 144, uh, 14439 is the terrestrial frequency, 145.825 is the uh, space frequency for all these satellites. If you beacon on that once a minute, 24 hours a day, you've got a chance of getting anywhere from 2 to 10 or 11 um, packets from that device uh, every day. So it, it's very inefficient. You're, now, if your device could calculate when the satellite was coming over, you could save power by only transmitting when a satellite was in view but you're probably going to run, spend more power running that processor to do all those computations than it is to just transmit once a minute and let the satellites pick it up whenever. Uh, so those are the, um, like I said, this, you can download this from APRS.org. Uh, but APRS.IFI is every pack on Earth, you know, the map, the Google map. APRISS.net is the map and just the packets that go via the International Space Station. And PCSAT.APRS.org is every packet that went via that satellite. Um, that's what PSAT 2 looks like. Everything is stuffed into the center axis because, you know, if you can't make a football spin this, you know, the long way. It'll always turn around and go flat. Uh, and we had to make it spin about the z-axis in order to get equal illumination on the sun. So we crammed everything into the center. And, um, oh, and PSAT, anybody in here do PSK 31? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, PSAT has a PSK-31 uh, transponder. In fact, it's the primary payload of PSAT, uh, PSAT, yeah, PSAT. Uh, because we've already got two PC, uh, APRS transponders. I wanted to get the PSK-31 transponder up there. So what this does is it listens on 28 megahertz for, uh, in fact, everybody that's on 10 meters, PSK-31, when our satellite comes over, all you got to do is tune the FM downlink and you've got the audio of the entire HF 28 megahertz uh, spectrum. And so you can just click on here and um, but the beauty of it is you're operating full duplex, right? So you are transmitting along with 30 other people, you're all in the waterfall and so you're carrying on a 30 to 30 group conversation if you want. So it's, it's just really a lot of fun. Although most you'll ever see is maybe one or two users because it just you know hasn't caught on yet. But at five times a day this thing comes over, tune your radio to 435.35 and you'll hear it. Um, and that's what the PSK31 linear, uh, the transponder, this is the 10 meter you know, linear single sideband receiver, audio out, goes into an FM transmitter. That's how we saw, remember, um, the Doppler is 18 kilohertz at UHF. And PSK31 has to be within a fraction of a hertz to work, right? So you couldn't possibly do the normal um, ham transponder. So we do the linear receiver at 28 megahertz, which is one which only has uh, a couple of hundred hertz software because, you know, it's much lower than UHF. Uh, and that's the uplink, and you can't get rid of that doctor. But then we take that audio and send it down on FM. So now the the Doppler of the spacecraft motion is not added to the tones, it's added to the FM signal. And so, yeah, you tune your FM signal once, twice, three times during the pass, and you've got clear audio. Um, but the audio that you've got is, is only the Doppler applied at, at 10, uh, 10 meters. And so, during the center of a pass, when the Doppler is changing the most rapidly, uh, most normal PSK31 uh, decoders will, will fail. But while it's coming at you, or it's going like that, the Doppler shift is so slow that most Doppler program, uh, uh, PSK-31s can keep up with it. Excuse uh, me, what causes Doppler? Oh, you know, the railroad train coming at you? Okay. You know, the, the shift in frequency due okay. to speed. Oh, okay. okay. Now, so this is an uncommon, this is, this is a guy who's quite a, bit, uh, quite a bit away from the where the satellite's coming over. You see, if the satellite was coming right at me, the Doppler would be high-pitched until Cross you and then would instantly go to low pitch because passing you was very rapid. Um, if I'm coming right at you and there's a guy over here, the Doppler shift is very slow changing. It just starts out high and moves very slow. So this guy is quite a way off of the track and so he has quite a bit of Doppler. 
Well, it didn't take a guy uh, to one week after we lost the satellite who wrote a PSK-31 transmit only to, uh, code. And all you have to do is download the, the tracking elements for the, the satellite. And that thing pre-compensates <laughs> on the uplink. Nice. And there's two advantages to that. Number one is a lot of the PSK-31 software is, is half duplex because you know, on HF, you can't transmit and receive at the same time on the same frequency. So most of the programs are just half duplex. You can't transmit and receive at the same time. So rather than waiting for all of these PSK31 authors to add full duplex capability, the fact that this guy wrote a transmit only means you can run that at the same time as your, your normal PSK31, and now you're full duplex. And the transmit uplink is doing exactly what you want it to do to pre-compensate. So this guy, that's the straight railroad track, is the pre-compensated. And, uh, and, and now this guy is uh, not very much Doppler. This guy would be fully decodable up there. And this is the beacon. The beacon, uh, the telemetry from the spacecraft, is included in the downlink. And in fact, you can see it up there. In fact, you see the DK3WN Doppler test via NO84 uh, PSAT test from DK3WN. So that, that's that guy. And where is the uh, you know, test? Uh, anyway, so the precompensation is based on uh, pre uh, predicting the path of the satellite. Okay. Yeah. Which, you know, you can download the elements set. Now, of course, PSAT has to have a lot of antennas. It has to have two VHF antennas cross-polarized so that, you know, you're immune from nulls. It has to have two VHF antennas for the same purpose. And then it has to have a six-foot HF antenna. And we made it all out of, uh, you know, piano wire, except it's not piano wire. It's night and all wire, uh, a little more expensive. But you can wrap that around a pencil as tight as you want, let it go, and it comes out perfectly straight. <laughs> So that's what we use, and this is showing that it all unspooled, of course, since it's laid on the ground, uh, gravity caused some drag, but at least it didn't get caught up on anything. And so we had a, 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 an excellent deployment in space. Uh, but the challenge was to get all six of those antennas to all end at the same spot. You see that resistor? That's our burn resistor. So that you bring all the antennas all around the spacecraft, get them to where they all end right there, and then tie a piece of fishing line around it, and that's your release mechanism. As a 10 ohm resistor, you put in 8 volts for about 3 seconds, the nylon line melts and all the antennas spring out. Very simple. Now, uh, PSAT does not have a GPS on board, but it, you know, it follows the Kepler's laws of motion. And so as long as we know what orbit it's in, that orbit is exactly the same. It's just that the Earth rotates underneath it. Anybody remember the early Oscar days where you had to do all this manually? Okay, you know, you had a little clear plastic thing that showed where you were on the Earth, and then you'd rotate that, and it would, you know, you, you could track satellites uh, manually. So in PSAT, we do the same thing. We just made one copy of the orbit, copy down all those latitude and longitudes, and now all we do is every time we cross the, uh, the equator, we start the clock, and then we just transmit those lat longs. And then after that orbit, you shift this whole thing by the uh, longitude increment, which is you know how far has it moved to the west, or how much far has the Earth moved to the east. Um, and then you, you just add that to the longitude. So that allows us then to save power, because we told it, OK, don't transmit anything while you're over the non-ham uh, radio populated areas. Um, and this is how not to make a satellite. So <laughs> there's 27 components that we added on after we built the boards. Uh, to make it work the way I wanted it to. We had to cut a hole underneath a battery just because we, you know, there was, we were a sixteenth of an inch. You just couldn't fit it all in. So that's the basic stamp processor from the board below sticking through the hole and nestled up against the battery solders right on top of that. Um, so this next APR satellite is this one. Um, well, it's QuickCom 1. But QuickCom 2 is what I want to talk about. QuickCom 1 is just another APRS transponder in space. The reason I'm not going to talk about it is after we worked a year on it, they couldn't tell us anything about it because we never could get the Naval Academy to sign a non-disclosure agreement with NASA. Mm. Okay. Um, and so it wasn't until uh, we delivered the satellite that, and we were having some issues and they said, it's only going to be up for a week. Couldn't believe it all that year. Uh, they're going to deploy from the space station attached to a really huge satellite that's going to uh, deploy some solar panels to test the solar panels, and that much drag is going to cause it to come in and burn up a week later. So, anyway, this is QuickCom 2. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to turn, let me turn on the radio. Uh, and make sure I'm on the right. Now I've got to change the uh, space frequency. Uh, 
eight, two, five. And so when I turn this thing on, uh, you know, just assume it just came over the horizon. I'm good to go. Uh, just assume it came over the horizon. And uh, uh, after six seconds, it's going to be all booted up and it'll transmit. Okay, you heard the packet. Okay, the packet says uh, DTMF W380O CQ APRS touchtone. And you notice the voice that says uh, DTMF is or whatever. It said grid is on. Now, the problem with all these APRS satellites is how many in here have an APRS radio? Okay, but that's the problem. Six out of, usually it's six out of 60 or even less. And so, because this is a six hundred, $500, $400 radio, and so APRS is, is a lot of fun for a lot of people, but the other 90% aren't having any fun because they're not going to spend that money on him. Now, are you just listening to a satellite signal? No, no, this thing is, oh, okay. is, is what's going to be on there. Okay. So, but it, you know, it, it came over and it just told us that, oh, and of course, remember, this list button here uh, lists the last 100 stations I've heard, and each station has nine pages of information, okay? And so that one packet uh, showed me, let's see, what did it say? It says that that was a status packet. The status is DTMF W380O CQ APRS touchdown. Um, and then it also shows the range and distance to the satellite uh, and the course and speed of the satellite, which is not very useful, the altitude of the satellite and the, uh, uh, the lat long and what path I use to hear. Um, since all of these satellites are on the same frequency, whenever they transmit, they're transmitting via the, the other satellite if the other satellite happens in view. If you're direct, you'll hear it direct. But if there are two satellites that happen to be in view, now you can go from one person to one satellite to the other satellite and come down uh, in, in a, halfway around the world. So, okay, but anyway, you'll notice that it said uh, grid and messages are on. So the thing that QuickCom 2 does is what I've been wanting to do since the year 2000, is when I first uh, uh, built my first one of these, is that Everybody has a radio that has a touch tone keypad on. And although this is a 400 for sending text messages, now you wouldn't believe the number of ham radio operators that said, I'm never going to send, you know, how, you know, in 1990, they were saying, you, you know, touch tone is ancient. Nobody's going to send a message from the keypad on their radio. Nobody. Well, look at every kid in America, right? We've been, you know, unbelievable. And yet, uh, ARL just refused to say that APRS had any value to ham radio because nobody's going to send messages with their thumbs. Okay. So, uh, but every radio going back to 19, when did the ICOM 2AT come out? 1978 maybe? Every radio always back there has the touchstone keypad. So the fact that this has $400 worth of a modem in it, it's still, the human interface is still the keypad and there's the display. Well now, the, the touchstone radio that you, you have in your pocket from uh, 40 years ago um, can send APRS uh, simply what you do is you don't put the modem and everything in the radio you put it at the receiving end so you just receive the touchstones and you convert that into APRS at the receiving end um, so then how do you get back to the display the touchstone radios don't have a display on them that, that you can send text to it's voice uh, what is the number one human interface um, uh, for receiving data when you don't have any other means, and it's voice. You know, you call up your telephone answering system, you, you get your messages, you know, by voice, uh, you know, uh, uh, voice messaging, all this other kind of stuff. So I said, let's use the, the keypad for uplink and then voice for downlink. So I'm going to send my um, um, grid. All I sent was 16 characters, and that included my entire international call sign and my grid square, which this thing converted to an APRS packet and sent it down on the APRS downlink, which got received in the global APRS network. So everybody in the world, if they were looking at the APRS map, would all of a sudden see that I'm at, at that grid square, I'm on the air, and yeah, live, that I'm on the air. Dumb question. For those of us who are new, What's an international call sign? Uh, six, six letters, six letters alphabetic. Uh, in other words, the same as our normal. Yeah, normal, normal hand call sign. Uh, and and the, the thing that revolutionized this, uh, 
just this last year was that I came up with a, a, a code that, you know, the original code was, you know, if you wanted the letter A, you pushed it once. If you wanted the letter C, you pushed that button three times. Mm -hmm. And so every call sign was a variable length, and some call signs would not fit into a 16-character touchdown memory, which all radios had a 16-character touchdown memory. Um, but for this thing, I wanted to have the four-character grid square plus the call sign all fit into 16 characters, including the star at the st beginning and the pound at the end. And what I realized was, you use that other code which says, um, no, you just spell out your call, WB4APR, uh, which you just look at the thing and, and send it in. But then you write down the numbers. You know, W is the first letter, B is the second letter on its key, 4 is the zeroth character on its key. So you write down those six numbers which tell you which position on which key it was. You encode that in 12-bit binary, hmm. and 12-bit binary can fit into four digits decimal. And so now I've got a six-letter call sign, which you just spell the number just by looking at any touchstone keypad. And then you calculate this number in binary. And so now in six and four, in 10 characters, I've got every call sign uh, in the world, which leaves me four digits for the grid square, FM19. All right, now, could you say, well, uh, grid squares are pretty boring. Well, not if you listen to the satellite, because that's all they talk about. You know, they're exchanging grid squares, putting themselves on the map, they're contesting the whole nine yards. So, but, but I said, well, let's let them send messages. Now, how am I going to get messages into four bytes, four digits, four decimal digits, not four bytes, four decimal digits? And what I realized was I went to look at it in all the traffic that's going via the International Space Station and PCSAT and everything else over the last 10 years, and hams say a lot of the same thing. So I took the top 99 things that have ever been said and put them into a table, and so now all you have to do is, is send a two-digit code which says which of those 99 things. <laughs> and then there's two other digits that allows you to put a number in it to, you know, it says, uh, uh, happy birthday, you know, I am blank years old. So you send the message that says, happy birthday, I am blank years old, and then the other two digits say how old you are. So, um, so that's the message. So I'm going to send you a message now. Now, this, this is the cheapest voice synthesizer we could get, and we just didn't have time to go looking for anything else. So it's hard to understand. But see if you can hear what this thing says. So I'm going to send... Uh, this time I'm going to send message number 11. itself twice and some of that was out of order. But what it, what it was trying to say was WB4APR says ARL message number 11 established amateur radio communications on 22 megahertz. Okay, All of that with four digits. <laughs> uh, because, you know, amateur radio has already the, uh, the standard ARL radiograms and there's a couple dozen of those and then they have the emergency radiograms and then we just sat down in a, a thing group and thought of what are all the other things we might want to be able to say like go navy beat army you know all those are <laughs> so anyway is that programmed in there yes um but i don't even remember what the name you know you got to have this list of 100 things in your back pocket to know which one to send yeah when are you going to upgrade the synthesizer chip uh it'll be on the next flight after this and we're already working on that so all right but see once you hear it you get accustomed to it you, you can Understand what you saying. don't like robots? What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> <Racist>. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the whole board. What it consists of, female voice. What it consists of is the speak jet chip, which is three dollars. The speak jet chip, but you have to send it phonemes. Then there is the uh, text speech chip, which I bet is an Arduino pre-programmed. You know, it's, it's a chip that has everything scraped off of it. It's just a black chip. Uh, it costs twenty bucks. And that just takes ASCII text and converts it to the phonemes to send it to the speech chip. And then I program the basic stamp because I, I haven't graduated past basic, you know. Um, and so the basic is what does oh, well, the analog hangouts. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it does all the conversion of uh, the, the five digits coming from, or the five bits coming from the DTMF decoder. Uh, and then the basic stamp sends what it needs to over the voice, sends the data over to the APRS radio so it sends it down. Uh, oh, at the same token, people that do have the APRS radio can, of course, send any message they want, uplink it, and it'll speak it for the guys that have the voice-only radios. So it allows those two, two communities to communicate with each other. Okay, I'm going to turn that off, and 
move on to the, uh, oh, okay. Now, how did I get FM19, a typical grid square, into only four digits? Because how do you get FM in there? Well, I went to look at every grid on Earth and realized there's only 99 grids that have anybody living in them. So there's, <laughs> there's my two digits. So two digits. So FM is really 18. One for the United States, the eighth square, which is FM, and then 19 is the grid that we're in. So FM 19 encodes as 1890. Um, what do we do for the Islanders? Uh, let's go. Oh, they, they, they could actually send a, they can spell it out. And it, it makes the packet longer. We can always go back to manual mode. Yeah. 